All right, so today we're going to start with chapter 14. Uh, chapter 14 relates to what we talked about with genetics before, but what we're going to talk about today is genetic control. So before we go on to this, I'm going to ask you guys an important question that I want you to think about, and that is, do all of your cells have all of your chromosomes? People are often tempted to answer that question with no, certain cells only have certain chromosomes, right? Because it's obvious to us that not every cell in your body um, needs all of the DNA in your body. But if we were to actually go in and look, um, all of your chromosomes are present in all of your cells. Um, this is why if there's like blood or hair or something like that found at a crime scene, they can use those kinds of cells to get somebody's um, genetic profile, right? So all of your chromosomes are present in all of your cells, but not all of that DNA is needed at any one time in any one cell. So what that means is that all cells need to have a way of turning genes on and turning genes off. So a certain part of a chromosome will be used in a certain cell and another part of the chromosome will not be used. So what chapter 14 is going to be about is how do your cells turn genes on and turn genes off? Um, and cells need to have a way of doing this because it's going to prevent them from uh, wasting energy, right, by making proteins they don't need. And in some cases, if they made proteins they didn't need, right, the cells wouldn't function anyway. So turning genes on and turning genes off is going to be very important. Um, and this principle is going to be something that we call genetic control or gene expression. So gene expression um, means different types of cells need different proteins, um, and we don't want them to waste energy. So basically what I just said gives you an example of um, what gene expression is and why gene expression is controlled. So if a gene is expressed, that means that it's on. It's currently being used to produce the protein that it makes. If a gene is not expressed, we would say that it is turned off. It's not making the protein that it usually codes for, um, and it's not being read by um, RNA polymerase, which then means it's being turned into a protein. We're going to start with genetic expression in eukaryotes, or sorry, in prokaryotes, because as most all, all things that we've been learning about through the year, um, the system is simpler in prokaryotes than it is in eukaryotes. So we're going to start with bacteria, and then we will build up to um, more complex structures and regulation in eukaryotes. So the way that bacteria rep, uh, control their gene expression is to have these structures in their chromosomes called operons. So an operon is a set of bacterial genes and the sequences that control them. So here I have a picture for you, but I'd like you to just go ahead and draw a simple picture in your notes. Um, and I'm gonna show you guys how I would do this. Um, just take your whatever writing utensil you have, you don't need colors or anything, and draw yourself a single line. Ooh, hopefully, wow, that's a race. Um, let's try to draw a straighter line. <laughs> okay. So we're going to draw, hopefully, wow, I did a little better, but not much. Okay, so you want us to have a couple of segments. So here, we're going to have a P segment, then here we're going to have an O segment. P stands for promoter. O stands for operator, and then we're going to have three structural genes. And for our purposes, we're going to label these structural genes X, Y, and Z. I realize they're labeled a little bit differently in this picture down here below. Um, we're just going to keep it simple and label them X, Y, and Z. So this is a basic operon. Um, each operon is going to have all of these parts. So it's going to need structural genes, it's going to need an operator, and it's going to need a promoter. Now, the structure of the promoter, I'm gonna redraw my operon. Since you guys have it in your book, you don't need to redraw it every time. But since I'm flipping through on my slides, I'm just gonna go ahead and redraw my gene. So, or my operon. So we have genes X, Y, and Z. 
Then we have our promoter region, which comes before our operator region. Now, the promoter is where RNA polymerase is going to bind. So remember, RNA polymerase is what reads DNA and creates RNA. And then the RNA is what allows amino acids to come in um, to match with the uh, TR or to match with the mRNA codons, and the ribosome then will build a protein from that RNA. Um, if so, in order to get that RNA that we're going to use to make proteins, um, we need to actually bind RNA polymerase. So let's go in here and let me show you how this would normally happen. So um, RNA polymerase is going to come in here and it's usually going to bind to this region called the promoter. So this would be RNA polymerase sitting in here. We're just going to abbreviate polymerase because that would take forever. So this is RNA polymerase. It comes in here and it sits on the promoter. Now, when it gets to the promoter, it's going to go ahead and travel down the gene, okay? And as it travels down the gene, it will read all of these genes here so that they can be turned into protein and then they can be um, assembled and used for things, okay? So once these are read, they get turned into RNA, then they get turned into protein, and we would say that they are being expressed. So if the promoter can bind RNA polymerase, this gene will be expressed. Now let's talk about the function of the operator. So I'm going to redraw my uh, operon one more time. And we have our same structural genes. Nothing's changing, right? So we have X, Y, and Z. Um, but now we're going to show you the function of the operator. So the operator is what allows the gene to be turned on or off. And the reason is um, a repressor protein can bind to the operator. So the function of the operator is to sit between the promoter and the structural genes and to bind this repressor protein. So let's go ahead and draw in what this repressor protein might look like. It's usually a protein that is quite large and what it's going to do that's important is it's going to not only bind to the operator but it's going to sit on a part of the promoter so if rna polymerase were to come back in here and try to bind let's try to draw it the same size as last time so rna polymerase right is going to come try to bind here it's not going to fit because the operator is going to be bound with this repressor protein. Let's label that guy really quick. So this is the repressor. So the repressor is going to be bound, which means that RNA polymerase, so this guy, can't fit onto the promoter anymore. And so since RNA polymerase can't fit here, okay, we are not going to be able to have it bind. It's not going to be able to make any RNA and we're not going to get any proteins. So these structural genes are effectively blocked, okay? So what that means is because these structural genes are blocked, um, we, uh, we don't, this gene is turned off. So this gene, another way of saying that would be that this gene is not expressed. Um, so we've talked already about the structure of those genes um, and just basically they make proteins that the bacterial cell may not always need. So we're only going to have operons on genes that need to be turned on or off, which usually is most of the genes. Okay. Now there's also another gene further upstream of the operon. So let's talk about what I mean by upstream. If we were to draw our operon here, we have, right, hopefully this is becoming a little bit more familiar now, you should be able to do this from memory maybe. You have a promoter, you have an operator, then you have your three structural genes, X, Y, and Z. Now, those of you guys who are paying close attention here, notice that you have a certain amount of repressor protein, right? Um, so how could we turn this gene off more often, right? So what's going to control whether or not this gene gets expressed? Well, it's part of it is going to be the amount of the repressor protein that we have. Okay, 
So um, we could have a couple of things up here. So let's go somewhere up here. And now this is not going to be like to scale. So I'm going to put these little marks in here to show kind of a break. So a certain amount of DNA would be here. But then we would have another gene here, which would be called our regulator gene. So when we use terms in genetics, we would call this upstream um, because it comes before comes before these structural genes. So we would say that something that's here is upstream of the genes. Okay, imagine like a fish swimming upstream, right? So normally um, the RNA polymerase would read in this direction. So this would be downstream. If we're going this way, we're going upstream. So the regulator is going to determine the amount of repressor protein that gets coded. Okay, so um, there are often multiple levels of regulation in a uh, bacterial cell. So one is going to allow, um, you know, if we make more regulator protein, then the uh, gene is going to spend more time in the off position. If we make less of this regulator, uh, you know, if we make less repressor protein, then the gene is going to spend more time in the on position. So another way that a bacterial cell can control um, this process is to make more or less repressor protein by reading the regulator gene more or less often. Okay. Um, there's another way uh, that the uh, repressor protein, so I want to explain to you guys a little bit about how this repressor protein can work. I mean, in order to do that, I'm gonna have you guys watch a little video about the LAC operon, which is a, um, an operon that functions this way, okay? Um, you're not gonna to need to know all the details in that video, but I do want you to pay attention to how there can be a change in the repressor protein's shape, okay? So that change in the repressor protein shape is gonna be important because it will help it prevent it from attaching to the operator in certain circumstances. The LAC operon is a special operon that's quite famous for um, regulating a bacteria's ability to eat lactose. Now, when does a bacteria need an enzyme to digest lactose is the question that the LAC operon answers. And if you think about it, it's pretty straightforward. When does a bacteria need to digest lactose? Well, when do you need to digest pizza? Only when you're eating it, right? So if you haven't eaten pizza lately, you don't need to digest pizza. Same thing for a bacterium. If it hasn't eaten lactose, it doesn't need to be making enzymes to digest lactose. So a bacterium is only going to produce the enzyme to digest lactose when it needs to be digesting lactose because it's in a lactose-rich environment. Okay. All right, so these are two forms of control for gene expression. Um, so the one that we just talked about um, with lactose is like um, is like an on-off switch, okay? So that gene is either completely on or completely off. This is called negative control. And what I want you to think of with negative control is it's always on or off. So if you think of a light switch, Okay, here's my rudimentary light switch. Okay, so it can be on or off. There is no intermediate location for this to be, okay? With positive control of a gene, this is where that repressor or regulator gene is going to come in. And this is positive control. So positive control is more like a dial switch. So if you're on your stereo, right, your car, you're listening to some music here. This looks more like a face than a stereo. Okay, you got all your buttons. So your volume control is like the more you turn it, the louder it gets, right? So you can turn it up. You can turn it down, but then you have a different button that is your power switch, right? So this would turn your radio on or off, but the volume control is going to determine up or down, right? So you can have more volume or less volume. Positive control is like that volume control. 
So sometimes um, operons will make what's called a transcription factor. And a transcription factor actually increases the amount of times that RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter. So what that does is it's like volume control, it's turning up the production of the protein. So the more transcription factor we make, the more often RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, the more RNA copies we make from those genes, the more proteins we get. So we can also have positive control where we increase or decrease the amount of protein we're making. So negative control, just to review, is either you are making the protein or you're not. The, the gene is either on or off. Positive control is, okay, now the gene is on, but we can either increase the amount of product we get or we can decrease the amount of product we can get. So you'll want to keep those two kinds of controls separate. All right, we're going to stop there for today and I will cover eukaryotes in a different lecture.